Welcome back to the Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series shown exclusively on YouTube. I'm critically acclaimed national author Cousin Vinny Agnello and this is my classic novel in the second edition, The uh, Devil's Glove. And uh, we've been reading, we're going to be reading about 180 pages, not all at once, in 15 minute segments, one of the great teases of the Western world. And when we're done, you're going to have a chance to buy a discounted copy of The Devil's Glove, signed, you know, personalized in the whole nine yards, for a, a very economical rate. Um, up here behind me is my phone number. If you need to call me earlier to order a copy, that would be great. And my email address is CousinVinny10 at gmail.com. Use it for the details. I left you off yesterday on page 116 in a chapter called A Conspiracy is Brewing and Eddie Romano is a little worried that um, some kids at school are looking to get him. And uh, here we go. It was plain to see that Eric Best was fast becoming Johnny Mitchell's new right-hand man. They went everywhere together, and kids joked about how they were joined at the hip. It was a strange pairing, <clears throat> since the two of them were so different. Johnny was the school's best athlete, and Eric was just trying to fit in and be popular. Eric was a slender but muscular kid who always wore a leather jacket. He modeled himself after Fonzie, a character from the popular television show Happy Days. And he knew that if trouble was coming at school, it would be coming from Eric. His instincts were absolutely correct with this supposition. One morning before first period, Eddie was walking quietly down the hallway toward his home room when Eric stepped out in front of him, impeding his progress. Eric took a quick drag off his cigarette and blew the smoke in Eddie's face. Eddie clenched down hard, putting a death grip on his, quote, magic glove, and stood nose to nose with Eric. Eric disdainfully flicked away his cigarette and told Eddie, say you're the punk that everybody's afraid of around here. Well, you don't scare me. Look, man, I don't have a problem with you. I don't even know you. And to tell you the truth, I don't even want to know you. So why don't you do us both a favor and step out of my way, Eddie declared with no emotion. Suddenly, the hallway was filled with onlookers as they stopped to witness the confrontation. Johnny Mitchell was among them, and he smirked as he observed the altercation that he had dreamed about. A few kids started chanting, Fight! Fight! Come on! Fight! Eric Best took a full step back removed his black leather jacket and threw it over into the awaiting arms of Johnny Mitchell, who imme immediately gave him the thumbs up sign. And he stood calmly, waiting for whatever was about to take place. Eric startled those gathered by shouting, Boo! And without provocation, proceeded to slap Eddie across the face. Eddie stood there motionless with a stoic look on his face. Eric proceeded to slap him again and received the exact same forbearing response. Come on, defend yourself. You're taking away all the fun. I thought you were some kind of tough guy. Eddie just stood there with one hand at his side and the other clenched like a vice on his, quote, magic glove. Johnny Mitchell walked over and whispered in Eric's ear, 
grab his glove. Eric just smiled and stepped forward into Eddie's personal space, then made a sudden move to wrest the glove away from Eddie. Eddie thoroughly expected this move and countered it by springing like a cobra, applying a vice grip to Eric's arms, locking them to his side. Then without warning, he systematically began headbutting Eric's face into a bloody pulp. There was blood everywhere as Eddie broke Eric's nose, using his forehead as a battering ram. Next, Eddie opened up a huge gash over the would-be bully's eyebrow. Lastly, he crashed his forehead into the, quote, greaser's head, causing an instant concussion. The entire onslaught took less than 10 seconds to complete and the crowd stood there with mouths agape, stunned. Eventually, a couple kids grabbed Eddie and pulled him away from Eric, who immediately fell harmless, harmlessly to the floor, unconscious. Eddie looked over at the horrified spectators and asked if anybody else had a problem with him. There was no reply as many quickly made their escapes. Eddie's demolition of Eric Best was the fodder for gossip in the school for many weeks to come. Nobody had ever seen anyone fight quite like that before. The physical act of headbutting someone's face into a bloody pulp was unheard of. To most of the onlookers, it was the most shockingly brutal act they would ever witness. Eddie's animalistic fighting technique became legendary at that school. From that moment on, kids, for the most part, kept their distance, and nobody else ever entertained the thought of provoking him. Unfortunately for Eddie, that was not to last. Next chapter, a security blanket. Three years had come and gone and Eddie was still as addicted to his antique glove as the day he discovered it. No matter what the occasion, the glove never left his side. At school it went to and from class with him. At home, it went to bed with them. Classmates joked that it should have been surgically attached to him. His parents and teachers coped with this addiction by thinking of the glove as Eddie's security blanket. For years now, Eddie had been nicknamed Linus by his classmates after the familiar Charlie Brown character who carried his blanket everywhere he went. Eddie brushed off those derogatory comments like a grain of salt. He could care less about what anyone would say or think about him. He became, at least in regard to his personality, an impenetrable island. The past three years, his mother had brought him to a bevy of different psychiatrists in a desperate attempt to find out what had happened to the gregarious, fun-loving, warm and humble son she had raised for the last 14 years. Unfortunately for her, the psychiatrists were unable to find any serious traces of mental illness. They concluded that Eddie simply chose to be an introvert and a loner. Dr. Reisenberg, a clinical psychiatrist, summed it up best when he said, Eddie displays behavior that ranges all over the emotional spectrum, from his braggadocio during baseball season to his quiet times at home during the rest of the year. 
He has a tendency toward what we call tunnel vision. He focuses his concentration on one goal and aggressively attempts to achieve it. As far as the addiction to his antique glove was concerned, the psychiatrist determined that it had a psychosomatic effect upon him. The doctors concluded that Eddie truly believed that the glove was responsible for the improvement of his game. And as long as he believed this, it would have an effect upon his performance. They analogized his belief in the magic of the glove with a hypochondriac's belief that a placebo was curing his illness. Dr. Reisenberg stated, it's the belief that counts with the psychosomatically inclined patient the glove has become superstition with Eddie. The old adage, if it's not broken, then why fix it, comes perfectly into play in his situation. He has become successful believing that the glove is magical, and any attempt to alter this belief could only be detrimental to him. Concerning Eddie's supposed, quote, make-believe phone conversations, with his baseball heroes, Dr. Reisenberg agreed with Mr. Romano that it was a product of an overactive imagination. After spending a considerable amount of time and money on Eddie's behalf, the Romanos gave up on their efforts of trying to change him. From then on, Mrs. Romano ignored her son's baffling phone conversations with the dial tone and Mr. Romano tried his best to reestablish a now strained relationship with his son. Next chapter, Tormenting Linus. The school bell echoed throughout the hallways of the high school and the students stampeded out of their classrooms toward their lockers. It was time to go home and everybody was in a rush. Eddie, now a freshman, carried his books and antique glove with him as he departed his algebra class. He then tried his best to navigate his way through the chaos and confusion taking place in the hallways. As he made his way toward his locker, he was bumped or shoved at least ten times by fleeing students on their way to the buses that waited outside. As he arrived at his locker, he noticed Sandy Roberts putting away his books and conversing with a friend. Roberts was the star pitcher of the high school team and he stood about six feet four inches tall. He was a big man on campus with the girls and his peers. He looked like a California golden boy with perfectly straight white teeth, an indoor tan and scattered freckles that covered a very cute boyish face. But Eddie wasn't concerned with how he looked, only how he pitched. And he couldn't help but eavesdrop on the conversation. Congratulations, Sandy. I heard you broke the radar gun the other day, commented Sandy's friend. Wow, news travels fast around here, huh? From the sound of things, not quite as fast as your fastball. I know. I was kind of amazed by that, too. I finally got the gun to register 90 plus. You see, you're exactly the reason I quit playing baseball my freshman year. I have been scared to death to stand next to a plate where somebody's humming a ball past me at 90 miles per hour. No siree, Bob, that's not for me. Let's hope all the players on the other teams are in the same frame of mind that you're in, Sandy said with a smile. And he put his books away and thought, holy shit, he throws the ball over 90 miles per hour. The thought of facing a 90 plus mile per hour fastball just boggled his mind. He knew the thought would bother him for the rest of the day, so he forced it out of his head. He looked around and saw that the hallways had cleared considerably of the, co of the congestion that had been so apparent just a few minutes earlier. He closed his locker on those unnecessary school books of his and headed down toward the gymnasium. 
As he progressed, he slapped the baseball back and forth into the palm of his antique club. As he turned the corner leading to the gymnasium, he noticed a gathering of junior and senior varsity baseball players who were intently reading something posted on the wall. He joined the gathering, but stood behind them trying his best to look between the players' heads to figure out what they were reading. And he was unable to see the posted memo, so he tugged on one of the upperclassmen's shirt sleeves to get his attention. What? the upperclassman asked in annoyance. What's it say? Eddie inquisitively asked. The upperclassman stared down at Eddie in a sadistic